return of the lion, chapter 10. <laughs> other guys to make me do stuff. Man, look at that rubber band. That's a good one. Taking the kids and Cammy to the speaking thing. And the reason why is because speaking for me, it's one of the high profile times where you get attention from people. And kids, my family, they're the ones that contribute the most to my work. They're the ones that pay when I have to leave and go work on projects. And the way I think about it is when I'm on stage, it's not just me up there, it's me and Cammy and my kids. I'm just kind of representing them. So for them just to pay the price and not be able to enjoy the benefits of the kind of work that I do is really kind of a bummer. So that's the reason why I take them with me. It's kind of cold out here. I go see, I go gun. By a car. We were living off of $10 a day at the time, and that launched me into a career as a professional blackjack player. There wasn't much coconut, but there's a little bit on the bottom, and a little bit of cookie dough. I tried to wait for you, but. Hey, 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 slow down. Oh, okay. Today's Q&A is powered by graders. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother. Okay. How's the book coming along? I don't know. We've been stuck in this proposal process right now. We're trying to find a literary agent. We've been turned down by three or four or five people. If you know of anyone, let me know. Thanks for asking. If you can spend one hour with anyone in the world to pick their brain, who would it be? C.S. Lewis. Really? There's two people I would choose right now. One is my grandpa and one is Mr. Rogers. A few tips for cultivating a love for learning in your kids. Um, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is taking the pressure off of them. Piano lessons is a good example. The kids have been taking piano lessons for three or four years. And the first couple years, I, I just didn't have them do any homework. We had a great piano, have a great piano teacher. He's on it, yeah. He really inspired the kids and we just let them play um, whatever they wanted to. By doing that for a few years, it cultivated in them a love for the music. Okay. Um, what was the biggest obstacle you had to overcome in order to spend more time with your family while you were working a 50 hour work week? I think the hardest part for me 
in the times that I worked the most, which was probably 40, 50 hours, was knowing where to set boundaries and where to turn my phone off, to turn my brain off, to stop checking email, to stop dealing with calls. At some point you have to decide when enough is enough, whether that's 8 p.m. or weekends or whatever it is, but you have to decide something and stick with it. Otherwise, whatever seems the most urgent, which as a man seems to be income related, client type stuff will always take over. Family is more important, but it doesn't feel as urgent. I think there's a song written about that. If you had to put your weekly rhythms in order from most to least important, what would be your top three? Number one, the most important thing we do every single week is Shabbat. That means rest. So from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, we rest as a family. That means no work. Uh, we spend family time together and we celebrate. I would say the second on that list would be family dinners. And then Bible time as a third, twice twice a week. Um, it's our yeah, weekly yeah, that's pretty business meeting. Important. A lot of the other things in the week get determined that breakfast meeting. Right, good job on this ice cream. There's like three flavors in here. Mm. How do you decide if something is important enough to change your weekly schedule? I think maybe what he's asking is how do you know when to cancel something in your weekly schedule for an exception? Mm -hmm. We make exceptions. Of course you have to make exceptions, but we make them very rarely because what we noticed was there's always exceptions. Once in a lifetime things we'll schedule things for. If it's probably like our top five relationships that we feel we're called to at that time, we don't mind canceling a weekly event. It kind of depends on what weekly event actually. A lot of our weekly events, they're kind of like placeholders. If we're not doing anything, then we're gonna run on Tuesday and Thursday and Sunday. And we're also not gonna schedule things proactively in that time, but we're not gonna like miss running for like if it's free ice cream day or something like that. Are you kidding me? We might be on different pages. <laughs> How do you show your kids that they are valued and loved? One way to do that is to get to know your kid. Each kid is different and unique and they have different bents that God's made them with. Part of that is recognizing how they feel loved by you and and that I mean I guess that takes time. I found the best way to show my kids that they're valued and loved is to actually value them. That sounds kind of silly but I think most males, they actually value their job more. I know I, at times I thought work was more important. And if you think work is more important, it will be impossible to communicate value to your kids because they're always gonna know that they're second best. So how do you explain the concept of treasure in heaven? Well, I don't know. I just read a book like a month ago and it was called The Treasure Principle. And when I say I read a book, I mean I read the first chapter. And it said that there's two kinds of investments you make. You either make temporary ones or eternal ones, but everyone's investing in something. Just invest in stuff that lasts. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Autumn from fourth grade asks, <laughs> question for Cammie. Can you tell us about a time when you felt God was saying something to you? Oh, wow. It was just actually in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I was had a lot of anxiety over a conversation I was gonna have with, with someone close to me. And um, I felt like God said to me, "You, I'll put the right words in your mouth and you let me change their heart. And it wasn't an audible voice, it was just inside my head and I just knew it wasn't m me. And I felt like it was God. A really, really impactful time for me hearing God speak to me was, I think it was the third or fourth time we did the, the Wonderland Trail. There's this part where you come up on a hill and you can see like probably one of the most amazing landscapes I've ever seen where you can see like three or four different mountain ranges all at once. And I've been up there a lot, but this, this particular time, it was just so clear and you could see, you know, see everything really, really well. Anyways, I got up there and and almost immediately when I, I started looking around, I just, I heard God say, I made this for you. Why would you do that? Like, how, how could you love me that much and care for me that much to do that? Same trip, I'll give you a bonus third one. 
Same trip, but our own people got turned out to me. I'm yeah. talking forever. Oh, okay. You have to like, you have to try and say it in like two or three sentences. You can't give all this backstory. So we're hiking in the dark and I looked behind me and I saw the, sh the looming shadow of, of Mount Rainier. And I felt like God was saying, what I made here is great, but you're my masterpiece. Jess says, what's the longest amount of time you ever took on a trail? We've done between nine and 12 days. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we did nine days when the ages of the kids were two, four, six, and eight. But that was because it rained so much. No, 12 days. Nine days of rain, but it was 12 days total. Uh, we've done it in nine days though, right? Yeah, that was maybe the third time. Oh, okay. What sort of trails rules do you have for the kids? Do you have any hiking norms? How far can they be ahead of you, behind you? Oh my gosh, my biggest rule is no <laughs> kicking up dust. The thing that we do at home too, but it becomes really important on the trail, we really teach our kids to think through things and be really wise. So that's not very specific, but... We taught them to stop at us. Every, every time they mm -hmm. see a sign, we tell them to stop. We were just finishing up our Q&A talking about how difficult it is to talk to the camera. For example, I could say, Yesterday, I was thinking about going to the store, but instead I talked to Cammy, and then we were sitting around for a bit and we, she got money from me and then we decided to get ice cream. Or I could just say, yesterday we got ice cream. Because I sit in the editing room all day long and I see these <laughs> videos go forever and I hear us be like, um, uh, yeah. duh. Because I don't even want to talk to the camera. So then when I am talking to the camera, I'm going on and on and on. And Ben's like, I'm like, fine, I don't want to talk to the camera anyway. <laughs> this is like my worst, my worst <laughs> nightmare. Because I actually hate talking on the telephone. <laughs> this is worse than the telephone. We're gonna grow up to be big vloggers. Mm. <laughs>